my name is Jamel Staples. I am a North Minneapolis resident. I've been in North Minneapolis pretty much all my life, aside from when my dad had carted me over south over here, not far from here, uh, the Mayflower Church over on 47th and Stevens, where I lived there for about uh, from 6 to 14. And um, for the most part, Renewable Energy Partners is a social, is a social, uh, uh, social impact company, right? We have, we're a mission-driven company. We're not just about making money. The objective is to make sure that we're doing this right from the first time. And what we see here is, is that everybody, and I get it, right? We got to mitigate climate change, right? That's one of the big deals right now. But at the same time, we can do two things at one time. We can address climate change and poverty, okay? Um, so Minnesota leads the way, right? We lead the way in one of the best places to live, best places to visit, best places to run, to run a business. But we also have some of the worst disparities in, this country, in the country, right? When we look at some of the, the economic opportunities, the jobs, um, education, employment, home ownership, health, a lot of other areas, we lead in those negative areas too, and we kind of sweep those under the rug. And that's kind of that's that's kind of a uh, something that's been kind of brought to the forefront more recently, but not really enough energy going behind it. And I see this opportunity in the solar energy industry as well as the other spaces of sustainability being not a silver bullet, but at least one of the one of the many pieces of the cog or the wheel to make it to, to address some of those issues. So this is the uh, Minnesota Minnesota unemployment rate graph, right? So you can see. I mean, we're looking at these at the num at the uh, the color colored graph, green being uh, Caucasians. Uh, blue being Hispanics and the purple being uh, African Americans and other people of black descent. Um, I just want to kind of look at this for a second. I mean, we are just now reaching a point where we are almost below 5%, but historically, over the last, what, almost 17, almost 17 years, we have maintained a threshold of at least a 10% unemployment rate as far as African Americans. <coughs> And we've seen also the Hispanic community uh, having those challenges also. So this is the Department of Employment and Economic Development's data. This is their tool that they basically put together each year, uh, or maybe even each quarter, I think that it is. And I downloaded this one today because I, I just kind of reshuffled the deck on, on, on the slides. So, um, uh, but this is, this, is, this is real data. And we're starting to see this because we're reaching a critical mass where we are at a point where we don't have enough people to do the work, right? And this, is this the only time that we're actually going to have this opportunity? I hope not, right? So, like I said, Renewable Energy Partners, a company I started back in uh, back about four years ago. Um, started out as an installation company. Ironically, we actually helped install the system that's on this church. Um, it was our first project. We had just, I had just signed up for the Minnesota Solar Energy Association, uh, and I went to that, that association meeting, and it was all white males, aside from one, one minute, one woman, Rebecca, I'm drawing a blank on her last name right now. Lumber. Rebecca Lumberg, there you go. And uh, from Powerfully Green, they installed this system here and, and I was, I kind of just showed up to the meeting. So, so let me give you some backdrop. I used to live in the Virgin Islands, right, for, for only a year, right? And I had, uh, I had a different deal going on down there. I had went down there because I hadn't, I was one of those non-traditional students that didn't that finished all the college credits except for 12 elective credits. So I was like, well, why would I stick around here in Minnesota when it's cold if I got a 12 elective? So I took freedom in geography, health and wellness, got certified in scuba diving. But in my off time, I volunteered and installed with solar down there. So when the, when the Minnesota Solar Jobs Act was being passed, I had just come back to Minnesota. And it was a unique opportunity that I saw happening because living in North, I live in, I live in North Korea, have this intention. I lived out in Dine for a year, right? And it's not really my cup of tea out there, right? So I moved right back to where I was from, and I liked it. And when I came back from the islands, I realized, well, how does this work, right? Because a lot of times when you leave and you come back, you start to see things that you didn't see before, right? It's kind of like if you go away and you come back and you see, you know, you didn't see that building that was there before. Even though it was always there, you pay a little bit more attention to it. Well, that's what I saw in terms of the folks in my community. I saw the people that I graduated from high school with because I saw them all the time. It was no big deal before, but now that I'm back and I'm seeing them and I'm and, and I've got a different different lens on, I see them in a different regard because they're not doing so well. So I said to myself, this is the, truly the Minnesota Solar Jobs Act 
this is an opportunity to really create jobs for those folks that I know that I graduated from high school with and some that did not graduate from high school with. We can create those jobs for those folks to actually participate in this, in this emerging economy. So my company is certified as a minority business enterprise. That kind of puts us in a position where we can work with some of the larger companies to meet and achieve some of their goals, even though the, even though the state does not have goals for solar energy projects right now. We're working on that. Um, Renewable Energy Partners is, is, a, is a company, obviously, but because we're mission-driven, there's a lot of underground work that nobody sees going on. I lobby at the Capitol. We've done training programs, the Minnesota Deep Pathways of Prosperity Training Grant. That was a grant that was received because my intent from the, from the onset was to make sure that people in North had access to participate in this industry. Now, there's no money in grants, really, right? I mean, like on a training grant, it's like 10%, right? But because I was committed to what we were doing, the objective and the goal was to make sure that we bring that training to the community. So when I realized that we didn't have the training, access to the training, I said, well, we got to fix this. But let me just slide through some of the projects here. We're, we were selected by the city of Minneapolis to develop the low-income community solar garden for the city of Minneapolis. Uh, we're looking at putting that, that system on the rooftop of the North High School, North Community High School, where I graduated from. It's going to be a one megawatt system. And what it's going to do is it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's an open opportunity for anybody who wants to participate, regardless of your income, regardless of your, I shouldn't say regardless, if you are a low income status, regardless of your credit score, because we know that this industry has now basically set the threshold, you have to have a certain credit score, you have to re make a certain amount of money. And a lot of people are being left out of the solar revolution, right? So that's further widening this gap that we have in disparities. Because if everything about it like this, the 80-20 rule, 80% 80 of the legacy customers, right, are all on, like the residential customers are paying for power just like you and I. And you got 20% that are being targeted, which are your commercial industrial accounts. And if those those 20% go away, that increases the, that, that increases the cost of the of, of power. Because we, we are paying for the legacy system. They're exiting the system, the, the, the coal fire plants and all the other mechanisms, and they're going away. That means that they need to make more money off of us to cover the cost of the coal, right? So that's a problem. And then when you have the, the lowest income and the lower income people, they are paying a lot more because they don't make as much money. They're paying a lot more of their income because they're not paying, because they don't make as much money as the, as the median, right? So as I said, Social mission of the companies provide career opportunities in the emerging clean energy industry for people of color while mitigating climate change. Um, anybody know who this guy is? Yep. What's his name? Van Jones. We'll give it yeah, to you. Right. <laughs> uh, and Van uh, Van was a Van was uh, the, the the person who founded Green for All. Green for All is an organization out of California, uh, Oakland, California. That's all about equity, right? They're all about like clean energy. Uh, making sure that people have positive health outcomes, have the opportunity to actually participate in the workforce and making sure that they're benefiting from these new systems that are being developed. So now you may see him, the next time you see him, he's, he's got a show on some channel and it's kind of like his, his catapulting point for this space here. He ended up be, being identified as the President Obama's um, green energy job czar, right? And then he didn't get confirmed and what happened was is, uh, and figure something else out to do because he had a wife and kids, which I understand he had to not abandon the work because he's still involved with Green for All, but he's, he had to pivot, right? He had to go do something else. So this is how I got into solar because in 2007, 2000, 2006, 7, and 8, when Obama, the Obama administration was talking all about these green jobs, we're going to retrofit, retrofit the United States, we're going to energy efficiency, solar power, this and that, I latched on to that. And I saw this as a huge opportunity. I still see it as a huge opportunity, but I didn't know I was going to have to do this much work to make it a reality for folks. <clears throat> so one of the challenges in Minneapolis at large, if you look at where we sit right now, if you drop a, if you drop a pin on your iPhone or whatever phone system that you currently operate, if you say, I want to actually get a solar training, I want to go take a solar training, uh, solar training job or, or get, the train, get trained to participate in the solar energy industry, because we know that training is imperative. No one wants to, a lot of employers don't want to train people, right? Because it's cost, it's costly. So what happened was, is we realized that the training wasn't accessible. So if you drop a pin in your iPhone and you say, I want to take a solar training job, solar training, you got to go to Century College. Century College is in White Bear Lake. How long, how long will it take you to get to White Bear Lake? From here. 
35 minutes. 35 minutes. So if you're a person of no real significant means and you need to take it, you need to take this, you want to take this class, you got to get on the bus, right? And if you want to get on the bus and take that mm -hmm. ride, it's going to take you about two hours, mm -hmm. one way, okay? Same thing with um, uh, line worker jobs. Doug was a line worker for years, right? Mm -hmm. Excel built this new, I haven't been there yet. Uh, Jim Pearson always tells me he's going to take me out there to the new training center out in Hugo. But Hugo, most people know where Hugo is, right? No, <laughs> you know where it's at. Okay, uh, Hugo's, Hugo's a good 30, 45 minutes at minimum, right? There's no public transit to get you there. The same thing with the IBEW Joint Apprenticeship Training Center. The IBEW, see that the electricians control a lot of this work right now. And because they control it in terms of the union, right? They have the ability to say you need to join, you need to go to the JATC. Well, the JATC is in St. Michael. You all know where St. Michael is. That's about another 45 minutes from here at minimum, right? And no public transit to get you there. Laborers also have a claim to this work. They can set up racking. They're out in uh, Lino Lakes. So when you look at the access to the training, but then there's also this cool little thing called the Minnesota Energy Center, right? University, of, it's the uh, Minnesota State uh, College and University system that actually has energy and career, uh, careers in energy. These colleges are all the colleges that offer programs. So if you can't read these, it says Riverland Community College, South Central, South Central College. That's down there by Mankato, Centuries and White Bear Lake. Minnesota, Minnesota State's a couple hours away. St. Cloud, Minnesota West, Southern Minnesota, Itasca, that's Itasca, Minnesota, Fond du Lac College, Anoka Ramsey, Dakota County, right? If you want to take any of these careers in energy, you got to go there. So that's a real barrier, right? Especially if we're talking about how can we make sure that we bring and develop a sustainable future for our energy production. No one's going to go out there. So what I've, what I've done is, is, is there's a uh, program out of Rochester, Minnesota, considering the disparity. So understand something. I kind of want this to be a little bit more interactive. You all can, if there's any questions at any given point, feel free to raise your hand. I'd love to, love to answer them, feel the need. So the Minneapolis Apprenticeship Training Center is something that I basically have been pushing the agenda to address, to, to actually um, create the access to the training that's necessary. Um, what this is, is we're replicating a model out of, C out of, out of Rochester called CTEC. CTEC is a program that we, it's a four partner program. It's the city of Rochester, Rochester Community Technical College, Rochester Public Schools, and Winona State University. Now, I'm a multiplier guy. I believe if, if I can do one, if, if I'm going to do something, I want to have it benefit multiple if possible. So like when I move to the islands and get away from the cold, I also went to school, right? And I also volunteered in Salt and Silver. So, so, so recognizing that we have a disparity in education, what I've done is I've found these models. I traveled the country. I looked at stuff down in Arizona, the East Valley Institute of Technology. There was a program, and they have a six, down in Arizona, they have a 65 acre campus. It's high school students get the skill sets that they, whatever folk tech program they want. Big deal, right? Uh, California has a program called Homeboy Industries. They train people to do, uh, ex -people, people that are coming from prison, gang members, and all the other, but like, so, and what, even whatever your situation is, they'll teach you to install solar, line workers, and they have a baker and some other economic development tools that they're utilizing. So, and then there's also one out in Massachusetts that I did not visit but very familiar with. But base, basically what we're looking to do is replicate this model out of Rochester. Rochester, those partners, those four partners, the college, <coughs> the city, the public school system, and, um, and the, and the four-year institution. They are creating a pathway for the high school students to get the hands-on career technical education that's necessary to make sure that there are no longer students that are being spewed out of the system without the skill sets to actually engage in the workforce. So what, what I've named this thing is the Minneapolis Apprenticeship Training Center. And it's basically what they do is they have three high schools in Rochester and all it's a centralized location for vocational technical training. The city sponsored the six and a half percent, you know, a half cent sales tax increase. They built a six and a half million dollar building and they, the city turned it over to the public schools. So when the public, when they did that, basically what happened is that the college and, and the public school system, they're getting dual credit. So you're getting, some of these students are graduating from college with a two year degree before they even graduated from high school, okay? CTE is, is the, the, the graduation rates here in Minneapolis, we've been working with the district, 
their program for students that take one CTE course. In certain races, that system is actually creating more opportunities for students to actually graduate. We've got almost a 50% increase in graduation rates from American Indians when they take CTE. African Americans increase by 17%. The Hispanic population increases by, I want to say, at minimum, uh, I think it was like 19%. So, I don't know, how many people in here went through a career tech ed program when they were in high school? Nobody? I went to Boys Technical High School, but okay. it was three years of this stuff. Okay. Uh, but yeah, so for the most part, that's what we're looking to replicate. That's what the Minneapolis Apprenticeship Training Center is. We're seeking to replicate that model here locally to provide the access to the training that's necessary and get and address some of the, not just the shortages, because we have a short a workforce shortage right now. In the state of Minnesota, we have more jobs, as I said earlier, than we have people. I was listening to it on my way in from um, from the Apple Store as I was coming in, and they were saying that there are our president Donald Trump is talking about apprenticeships, and they're saying that employers should pay for them. Well, this is a way that we can actually get public education to fund some of that stuff, right? Um, uh, well, I'm so sorry you um, to. So I made the acquisition. There's a there's a piece of property in North Minneapolis located on uh, Plymouth and Fremont Avenue. I'm not sure if any of you are all familiar with that, um, but basically, I've already acquired the building. The building that they built in Rochester is a 20,000 square foot building that they built. It cost them a lot of money. I bought the building for less than what they what it cost for the building. It's exactly the same size in terms of square footage. About 2,000 square feet more of my building is, and I'm working with the Minneapolis Public Schools now to actually bring that to fruition. We've got uh, the Minneapolis Community and Technical College on board. We met with the mayor of the city, the city of Minneapolis, and um, he's very interested in finding out how he can utilize his platform, as well as public resources, to actually bring that to fruition. Uh, we met with the Minnesota State Chancellor over all the colleges and universities. So he's in support of the project also. And by way of the relationship with the Minneapolis Community and Technical College, we, may, we have uh, a four-year institution on board also. And that four-year institution is Metropolitan State. So we have the four partners that are currently in existence that are now in Rochester. And Rochester's been a great partner. They've been very, very helpful and very interested in working together and finding out how they can bring what their experience has been down there to the Minneapolis area. Um, I'm curious about funding. Yeah. In terms of the, the facility itself? Yeah, where you get the money for the uh, facility and uh, you're going to have to pay all these teachers and stuff uh, before the students pay the tuition. Yeah. Uh, how's all that going to work? So what we're doing, so I made the acquisition as a private entity for the purposes of developing this facility. Uh, what Instead of the city ponying up or hassling sales tax, sales tax increase, which we don't want to see, right, as many of us residents, if where we live, um, I would be willing to do a lease with the city for the property, and the objective would be to make sure that we can provide the necessary access to the training. Now, the public schools have the resources, right? They're allocated money from the state, as are the colleges, right? And now that's the dance that has to happen between those two institutions in terms of making it work. Replicating that program out of Rochester is gonna be the best way forward, right? However they look at those financial resources, split them, and then cover the, the, the cost and maintenance of, of just ongoing uh, teachers and whatnot, that's going to be critical. Before. What percentage of the students are females? In Rochester? No, in the uh, Honestly, I'm not, I mean, it's, it's all, it's, 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 you can, it's all about choosing, right? If they're given the opportunity to engage and participate in, in the, uh, in the programs. So if a young woman is interested in, in participating as a, um, the programs that they have in Rochester are, uh, I want to say they have culinary, they have, um, they have some sort of a nursing program, they have construction, they have um, manufacturing, they have, it's like an advanced manufacturing, um, veterinarian, uh, it's like 10 different pathways that you can take, agriculture and a couple others. And it's all about, you know, it's all about student choice, right? It's not about, you know, guys can take this course or girls can take this course. It's about if you want to take this course, the course is made available to you, and you just have to just do your job and get the work done. She's mentioning it, though, because there's very 
a slim population of women in the solar industry. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and if there's an interest in, on behalf of women to be in this in that space, from electric, from even from an electrician's perspective, they can take those courses. No one's saying that they can't. <coughs> well, yeah. mm -hmm. There needs to be some aggressive marketing. Well, yeah. I mean, it, <laughs> it's, it's, it's all about. At the end of the day, it's really about being aware, right? And that's, making it, that's key. And that's being that's both from the solar energy's perspective making sure that they do have a concerted effort to actually address the issue of making sure that there's more diversification and women in that space and a, and a, and a push to actually reach out to those, reach out to those women. Yeah. You know, women, people of color, you know, people with uh, uh, learning disab disabilities and challenges, they need to make sure that we need to make, we need to do a better job making sure that there's, a, there's access to those women. Mm -hmm. Anyway, what I'm saying here is if I had my druthers about it, what they did in Rochester, they set up a, uh, an advisory committee, right? And the advisory committee made the decision about who was actually going to, I mean, it was an employer-driven uh, piece. So the employers of the various industries played a significant role in deciding what programmatic aspects were located inside that building for training. Meaning that we're not just training people for jobs that we don't know if they want or if there's going to be a job on the other side. It's the employer that are saying we need the students, we need the people, we want to make sure that we can get them to participate. I get it plugged in. I just popped up a little bit. I have, I have a question. Sure. Um, I went to uh, Southern Midwest, um, that fair, you know, down in uh, downtown, public, not this year, last year. It was downtown? Yeah, it was at the oh. Renaissance Hotel. Yeah. Um, and um, I was just, just going through the exhibit hall. Mm -hmm. Who who sets up and who thinks they are part of the solar industry? You know what I'm saying? Like all those vendors are there. Mm -hmm. And it's like a room full of people of different industries. And I'm just wondering when you have a program like this or how it decides the green industry, it's everyone from, you know, the, the, the equipment mm -hmm. manufacturers and the, the installers and the marketing and sales and the landscaping that goes underneath them, the bee, the honeybee people who want mm -hmm. to plant, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like this holistic uh, thing and I just wonder how, uh, where the umbrella appears in a school where there would be choices for a real broad group of people, not just uh, techies, you know, who want to be part of this revolution. So a lot of those conferences are based on um, people that want to pay for booths, right? Yeah, sure. And that it's a financial thing, it's a business transaction. So if you have, if you want to be a beekeeper and try and be a part of the solar energy industry, you pay for a booth. There you have it. You're able to sit in that in that area, right? So you got people that will sell. You got people that will sell um, that will come in and talk about you know uh, solar solar uh, flashlights, right? I mean. At the end of the day, someone leased that venue for the purposes of making sure that they could they could get their resource return as well as the profit. Yeah, most of the people were pretty straight, you know, electricians were obviously on the verge of becoming key to every, every, the whole business. It just kind of They're solving two problems. Yeah, that's what we're trying to do here, right? How do we tie these two industries and opportunities, these two <coughs> opportunities as a problem? People look at things as problems, I look at them as opportunities, right? How do we make sure that we have those same folks that need a job getting the skill set so that they can actually work the job, right, and go to get to the job, go ahead, John. I have a question, uh, and you, you mentioned it, and to me, as you've been talking, it just seemed like it makes so much sense. I've had some conversations through MRES with MCTC, mm -hmm. okay, yeah. and it seems like if you connect there, yeah. man, now you've got a place where people can really get together, and yeah. and, and so, and, and you, are you working with them? Or yeah, yeah, we've got, I've been in communication with Dr. Pierce, who's the president of MCTC, okay. she's on board with the concept, we met with the superintendent of the Minneapolis Public Schools, uh, they're going to assign a point person to work with us on this project. Remember, we talked about this project three years ago, that, yeah. right, the multi-purpose training facility is what it was back then. But um, and we've talked with, as I said, the Chancellor of Minnesota State, as well as the mayor and some of the council members. And uh, 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 like I said, by way of the relationship with MCTC, we have the relationship with Metropolitan State, which is a four-year institution. Okay. 
So do they have programs like this in other states? Yeah, they actually, these are, this is a, this is, we're like lagging, you know, like other states have these programs. It's not just solar energy. If I had my druthers about it, I would like to see green infrastructure, all the stuff, because we know half of these jobs that are existing now are going to go away, right? We know that. Automation, robotics, what they call mechatronics, right? That's, that's, uh, automa that's automation, uh, drone technology. Uh, you look at, you think about artificial intelligence. You think about, uh, like I said, green infrastructure, green walls, electric vehicle charging stations. These are the kind of career pathways that I'd like to see in this space. However, as, as, a, as a person who's just trying to utilize the, the property that I own for the greater good, I can only influence as much as I can. I can't be a decision maker at that table, right? I can try and say, hey, these are growing industries. You need to be targeting this. I think we should split it between half of the existing industries where workforce is needed, but then that other half we need to be targeting for those, those emerging growing spaces. So here are some of the information and data related to the Minnesota needs of an energy workforce. Um, the Minnesota Energy Work Energy Center is the Minnesota State uh, institution that targets the energy industry. Seven thousand jobs wow. by 2020 is what the ex expectation is. An hour. Yeah, thirty bucks an hour, about sixty grand a year, almost somewhere right, mm -hmm. just right around there. Um, you know, they're saying that the the, the American Jobs Project can support the 26,000 clean energy jobs, um, you know. So address, addressing climate change and poverty is, is something that I see is that I'm passionate about because that's what, you know, I think that we have a unique opportunity. I mean, everybody, most people care about the environment, right? And when we, one second, Doug, and when we look at this through the lens of people who are well resourced, right? And I didn't make this slide because I was kind of, you know, hustling trying to do some other stuff too. If we look at this as the financial structure of, of, of the US, right? Obviously the top is the big 1%, middle is the middle class, and the broadest portion of that triangle, right? Are the people of low income status, right? If we can get those people to understand that climate change is not just some conversation, it's an opportunity to get trained. It's an opportunity to get to work. We have a unique opportunity to, at, at turning those people like what Donald Trump did with the, the coal miners. We can, if we can attach a job to them getting engaged, we can actually start to change the, change the dynamics of the political structure because we invert, the, we invert the whole situation. Those people at the bottom start to raise up, right? Go ahead. I, I was just going to mention like with your last slide, I was just at a solar event yesterday, downtown Minneapolis. Yeah, right, and they're talking about a three billion dollar industry in solar in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what it be. Oh yeah. <laughs> you know, so I mean, the potential of what you're doing is just tremendous. So. Yeah, and I and thank you for raising that issue. Um, I mean, it's 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 a huge opportunity, and we, we're talking about solar, but there are so many other components that are, that are going to be that are going to so many other pieces. I mean, unfortunately, 10K exited the market, but they if, had they not exited the market in terms of production of solar panels and their proprietary, I mean, their, their technology that they had, I mean, if we could have found a way to keep them in business, I mean, think about how many other states have that billion dollar potential, right? Think about it. How big could that company have become? How many people in Minnesota could they employ? Right? How many people? How many? How much PV film could have been assembled here in Minnesota on behalf of that company? Right? Or racking and everything else that could have been could have been assembled. So, um, so the Minneapolis Apprenticeship so the Minneapolis Apprenticeship Center uh, is the is the first step in the development of North Minneapolis. I mean, most people you probably don't go to North much. Uh, I live two blocks from the site, and um, what I'm working on is what they call the East Plymouth Innovation Corridor. And what this is, is a different approach to development. This is what, this is the way that it should be, in my mind, right? The, the, the development of the human capital first. Develop the people so that they can earn income. And then you develop the infrastructure so they can support the infrastructure and all the businesses that are, that are go internal to there. So we're looking at, uh, you know, it's, it's on a transportation-oriented development site, meaning that it's right there on, on a bus stop. It's in within half a mile. But, the, the training center is the existing building that's there, the 20,000 square foot building, is right there on the corner. The five bus line, the highest use transit line in the state of Minnesota. Okay, so if you want to talk about you can't get to it, sorry, give me another excuse, right? Um, 
in addition to the fact that, you know, we need to lobby these legislatures this year to make sure that we get that transit money. I serve on numerous committees. I serve as the chair of the North Minneapolis Prime Zone HUD Economic Development Committee. Uh, I serve as I serve on the, um, uh, the Energy Vision Advisory Committee for the Clean Energy Partnership for the City of Minneapolis, which I influence. We, have, we, we got the 100% renewable resolution passed. Everybody heard about that? Nobody heard about that? The city of Minneapolis is going 100% renewable. Come on, let's go. All right. We, that, that, that body advised to the Clean Energy Partnership, which the mayor chairs, Excel's a part of it, uh, ex, uh, Center Point Energy Council members, as well as some of the other um, uh, staff in terms of the city, all are on that big board. And, and I sit on the smaller board of uh, uh, business and, and community advocates and other people. So we're going 100% renewable for Minneapolis. And the key is that what we have is a unique opportunity to, I mean, like there's other states that are doing it, other cities that are doing it, but what I'm focused on is making sure, and I have this in the resolution, I can share this with you all a little bit later, uh, we have in there, uh, 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 I have in there uh, a line item that says we will make sure that low income and people of color will have access to, the city of Minneapolis will do what it can to make sure that low income and people of color have access to the training to participate in this industry. And that's where you have to be. That's where it goes. Like you have to do, be a little bit of everything, right? You got to be at the policy table. You got to be at the work table. You got to be at the training table, right? So that's that's really what's, what's been happening here. But we're gonna. So the twenty thousand square foot building last year in Rochester serviced one thousand six hundred fifty students. That's a lot of students for one for one building, right? And that's not. They didn't stay there the whole time. They took a two hour block and then they went back to their home school. Well, the district in Minneapolis is much bigger. Uh, on the adjacent, across the street, I also own a parking lot, which is three quarters of three quarter acre of land. We're going to vertically integrate 80 to 100,000 square feet on that parking lot for the purposes of making sure that all students have access to participate in these sectors that are that are identified. <clears throat> so, some projects that we're, that Renewable Energy Partners is is, uh, is developing now. Um, you know, we've got. Old, the old home project in uh, St. Paul called Old Home, which is an RDF uh, grant from XL Energy. We've got the, uh, we're actually uh, working on, so the, the East Plymouth Innovation Corridor is, a, is a, about a five block stretch. And what it is, it's about innovation by way of bringing some of the more broad technology to the, to the community, at the same time providing that as a living laboratory for the students. So we're working with the Minneapolis Public Schools again, they have a big building, which is the nutrition Minneapolis, Nutri which is the Minneapolis Public Schools Nutrition Center. Directly south of that is Franklin uh, Middle School. Directly south of that is Hall Elementary. Now, and then there's North High, which is just under a quarter of a mile away. Amongst those four rooftops, we can fit just over maybe two 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 megawatts. And what we we were selected in partnership with the University of Minnesota. We've been working with the Energy Transition Lab. Uh, Ellen Anderson's team. We submitted an application to anybody ever heard of Rocky Mountain Institute? Yeah. Okay. We were selected for their ELAB program this year, and we spent four days out in um, uh, what's that, Sundance Resort in Utah. Uh, and basically, we went out there because we want to do a we want to make these three buildings a microgrid, right? So that students in this facility will have the opportunity to learn firsthand what a microgrid is, how it operates, how it functions. And see, the key is, is that, so, so we had, we had, good, we had really, really good participation on our team. We had Ellen Anderson from Energy Transition Lab. We had um, a public utility commissioner come along with us. We had the city of Minneapolis, uh, mayor staff, uh, XL Energy, and Open, Open Access Technology International, or o OATI, which is a big microgrid company. And they all came out, we went out, we, and it was basically a boot camp. We spent four days from like 7 a.m. to like 6 p.m. <laughs> talking about energy stuff, talking about microgrid stuff, putting the meat on the bone of that project. And when we came back, we went right like within the next two weeks, within two weeks, we went over to the public schools, we got an LOI, we're visiting their, their buildings, looking at the whole system at large, seeing how it all fits together, how it works, how we make it all fit. And we're going to make this thing a microgrid. One of the first things. One of the first things. Yes, yeah. So um, we and, and we were also identified as a uh, as a recipient of the LCDA Livable Community Demonstration Assistance Grants. I don't know if any of you engage with your metropolitan council members. 
Um, what that is, so the city of Minneapolis has to make a recommendation for your project to go to the LCDA at the Metropolitan Council. What we were asking, we, we were listed as the city only gets three choices. We were selected as priority number two for the Minneapolis Furniture Training Center. Now, we're not out of the woods yet just because we got selected. We still have to get through the, metro, through the Metropolitan Council's process. We have our application in, and we're hoping to get the award for finance, uh, the, the, recent, the financial resource of an award, which will help this project actually become a reality. Uh, we're also working with, like I said, OATI. We're working with uh, Cummings uh, uh, Generation. Um, we're working with some of the with some of the larger corporations to also bring this project, Minneapolis Furniture Training Center, to fruition. Um, so the next step, go for it. I'm curious about uh, who or, who is organizing that uh, innovation core. Oh, you? Yeah. Nice. Good work. Yeah. So we're working with um, there's some institutional owners along the avenue. Because, like I said, again, I'm a multiplier guy, right? How do I take one thing and utilize it for, the, for, for multiple uses? And that's where the conversation around the human capital development. But then what are the, some of the other needs around that space, right? What If you get somebody trained and they get a job, well, what else do they need? Well, they need child care. Well, Catholic Charities is right there, right? And that's their only early childhood education center in the state of Minnesota. So we've been engaged, I've been engaged, and, and some colleagues of I have been engaged with the Public Catholic Charities Organization about the idea of revisioning their site, vertically integrating, right? Because there's one level now. I'm sorry, go ahead. I, I was just going to ask you, you mentioned um, about two steps behind you there, but when you mentioned Ellen Anderson, I know she just got a $500,000, yeah, $500, half million grant yep. from LCCMR. Yep. And, and is, is your program part of that? Then? Yeah, I testified yeah, at cool. LCCMR really cool. with Ellen on behalf of that uh, that half a million dollar award. Um, what that is, it's, that project will be three uh, battery storage demonstration projects, one in uh, rural, uh, uh, in the Iron Range, one in Southern, and one in the Metro. And assuming everything goes as we have planned, we will put uh, battery storage in the existing 20,000 square foot building along with a solar array, which we will be utilizing pays financing, which is property assessed clean energy for the purpose of financing the 155 kilowatt system to go on the roof, which students will be able to go upstairs and also, you know, tinker with and, and learn from, as well as uh, see how the batteries actually function. Seems so. like control systems would be a good yeah. Business. Yeah. Um, so to that's. To get those kids interested in yeah. all the. Absolutely. Yeah. So that's one of the things that we're working with OATI on. Uh, and Cummins, we're, start, we're just starting to get engaged with Cummins. And, uh, you know, they'll probably, maybe, depending on how everything works out, maybe they'll be willing to lend some curriculum to products to kind of be a, a, a test line. Are you working with bets at all? We're working. So this facility will, in the daytime, the objective, primary objective of this facility will be for students of the high school age. But then in the evening hours, we're trying to figure out how we can work with adult basic education and the public school system, as well as MCTC, to also offer these courses to all other other people that want to take them. Go ahead, Doug. I, I got to ask you this one. Uh, I know you are a super busy guy, yeah. but when you say we, yeah. I mean, do you have any kind of staff helping you? Uh, I got it. It's, it's me, one and a, me and one half timer that I have working with me. And then all the resources that I can leverage from the University of Minnesota and other people who just step up and say they want to be a part of it and help them make this thing happen. Yeah, so, so you're, it's you're paddling as fast as you I'm can. I'm paddling as fast as I can, man. I'm trying to trying to keep it going. So. You you mentioned microgrid. Is is that a system that has all the components to to generate and store and transmit these? Yeah. So basically, what a microgrid is in short, we're connected to the big grid. All of our power, majority. I don't want to say all because I don't know all, but majority of our power is produced out in Becker, Minnesota through the coal plants, the three coal plants that are out there right now, and we are a part of a big grid, right? So what a micro grid is, is it's a smaller grid. It can be one building, it can be one block, it can be a designated, you know, radius, whatever it is. And basically what that means is that the, so the power production is, is localized. So you put solar on the roof. So you could actually make this a <coughs> somewhat of a micro grid if you had, a <coughs> excuse me, if there was enough production on the roof, uh, then you could put batteries down here in the basement, and then you could have control systems, as you mentioned, that would maximize the efficiencies of the production and use of that power. So you'd have to go in and size all your lights and all of your stuff to be most efficient, so that if there was ever a power outage, it would basically serve as a backup system. 
So it's kind of a localized, and, and then a lot of times you can pull them into island mode where you can basically hit a switch and it separates itself, like in North Minneapolis. So that's what this project is about. It's twofold, living laboratory for our students to learn from, but also resilience strategy for the city of Minneapolis. We had a tornado, uh, and you all on the south side also experienced that tornado. Um, knocked out the power for, I can't remember how many days over north. And this would actually be able to, uh, those three buildings, it could be, they could serve as a place to come back to plug in phones, charge phones. It's a nutrition center, so there's a big commercial kitchen. You could prep food there if there was a substantial, substantial amount of time that the power was out. And, you know, <coughs> shelter. Go ahead, Doug. One other thing that people should know is everybody is talking like microgrid is a new idea. Yeah. I managed two microgrids when I was in the service back in the 60s. Yep. Military installations have been using those for years yep. and years and even getting much more sophisticated. So this is just another yep. good application in the civilian population That's right. to, to disperse the energy requirements. So yeah, it's 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 really a cool idea. And I mean the fact that you got that going there, that's really interesting. We're just working. Yeah. <laughs> We're just working. Um, so yeah, so we have a, we have a variety of projects. This is one of them. Um, there's also Emerge, which is uh, it's a community-based organization. We're looking at putting solar on their rooftop. It's going to be uh, the Lending Hills uh, Community uh, Lending Hills Power and Light. They have we're we're working with them to get their system installed, developed, and installed. We are working on we have another couple projects. Um, George Robinson in North Minneapolis on Plymouth Avenue also has a uh, smaller uh, building where we're going to put some solar on his building. We just got the, the, the uh, engineering drawings back. Everything is good minus a few little tweaks that need to be made. Um, we're also working with the uh, University of Minnesota on some of their stuff as it comes to uh, as we start to get to the point where we can do the installation. So yeah, I mean that's, that's kind of what this has all, all been about is like how do we use these, these green systems as, me as an opportunity <coughs> to bring more people into the fold and start to change the minds and, and hearts and get more people engaged that have a tradition. Uh, has Jeremiah Nelson been helpful? He has. Uh, well, yeah, he has been. He has been helpful. <coughs> uh, you know, this East Plymouth Innovation Corridor obviously needs the blessing of the council member. There is one parcel of city-owned real estate which I'm working to acquire, um, which will. I keep talking about it kind of like it's a separate thing because it's it's this, this what we're talking about today is, is is the first step of a bigger push but what this and I'll just kind of highly go over it this was this this eastern half of Plymouth Avenue up to the North Loop Bridge basically is where we're at because we know North Loop is just about completely built out right and they're getting rents they're commanding rents of three and five and seven thousand dollars over there right and we don't want to see that happen in North Minneapolis we want to maintain the fabric of the neighborhood Meaning that those parcels that are there, that one, the one that's city owned, I like I said, I live two blocks from this site. When I want to go buy soap and lotion, right, stuff like that, or like a Target, I got to go downtown. Well, that's kind of challenging, right? So, like, we want to develop a commercial level and then some housing above. Um, then next door is the Catholic Charities organization, in which they just recently asked me to be on their board to help influence some of their some of their work around this early childhood ed. But also, uh, let's look at when people in North want to, like the older people want to move out of their homes because they don't want to go up and downstairs anymore. They have to leave the community because there's no real place for them to go. So why don't we look at incorporating senior housing above the early childhood education center, right? And then let's do another multiplier, right? Why don't we look at the idea of, since there's such a daycare shortage in the state of Minnesota and Minneapolis, why don't we put an early childhood education certificate program in that same space so that families or store people can learn to actually tear, take care of kids and then go and be an entrepreneur on their own. Next to that block is the um, uh, Minneapolis Public Housing Authority. They own 90% of the block. Well. They're, all, they're, not, they're moving in the direction of more density. As we know, the plan 2040 is really about like density, whether you're for or against it. I'm not gonna get in that fight with you tonight, okay? Uh, but it's about, they're, they're moving in the direction of vertically integrating more housing there also. And then that next block is the nutrition center and the, and the schools that we just discussed. And then across the street on the south side of Plymouth Avenue, uh, a colleague has acquired three acres of land for the purposes of developing a triathlon center. And what that's going to be is basically uh, they're going to tear the existing building down 
They're going to build a, uh, uh, the third Olympic size swimming pool in the state of Minnesota. They're going to have a running track, biking track, uh, and possibly some housing. So this is like the big thing, right? And But we want to make sure that there's affordability components, meaning that we're working with community partners to try and find ways to keep the, keep the properties uh, uh, affordable. So, all right, so that's all I got. I apologize for my tardiness. I was, you know, just trying to get the right pieces so we could super go through this. Any, any other questions?